Good evening, dear followers of Conflict and Resilience Research Institute and the Manitoba Council for International Cooperation. A warm welcome to our event today, which is taking place on the eve of International Development Week. It brings Canadians from coast to coast together to celebrate and exchange ideas about how we can all contribute to global development and peace. As said, International Development Week, which was established in 1991, has been marked each February and honors Canadians' efforts to provide global humanitarian aid. International Development Week provides a chance to acknowledge and showcase the distinctive contribution Canadians make to creating a better world. It motivates us, especially our youth, to learn about and engage with global concerns. Dear audience, you will hear more about the International Development Week and MCIC from none other than the Executive Director of Manitoba Council for International Cooperation, Janice Hamilton today. Welcome Janice to the webinar. Thanks Kauser. We're very delighted to be able to do this with you. And uh, it's a real privilege to be able to be here. Um, I wanna acknowledge um, that I'm joining from uh, Winnipeg and Treaty 1 territory um, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. Um, so this year, um, I, I'll talk a little bit about International Development Week and, and then a little bit about MCIC. But um, International Development Week this year, the theme is Go for the Goals. And it's referring to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And, um, and that's a global plan of action aiming to end poverty, uh, protect the planet, um, ensure that all people enjoy peace and prosperity by 2030. Uh, in other words, it's a path that seeks to shift the world towards a less wasteful, less destructive, and more sustainable and equitable mindset. One where no one goes hungry, no one feels unsafe, and no one is left behind. So it's an ambitious goals, but if we work together, we think that we can achieve them. And uh, as you mentioned, it's, it's, it's recognized by Global Affairs Canada and has been for many years. And so there's activities taking place all across the country. And we've had a number of events here in Manitoba. And this is uh, one of the ones that uh, we're doing, you know, it finishes up on Saturday. So we have some other contests going on in that. But if anyone wants to tweet, you can do hashtag go for the goals. Um, so maybe I'll just say a little bit about MCIC. Um, you know, we're a coalition of over 40 organizations involved in international development. And MCIC supports, connects, and amplifies the work of its members and its partners. And we also directly engage and collaborate with Manitobans for global sustainability. Um, MCIC has the privilege of receiving funds from the Manitoba government to assist our members in their international development work. And so this past year, we've received $1.6 million from the Manitoba government. And that has gone to our uh, member agencies for their long-term development projects, as well as we got some additional funds, 150,000 for the work in the Ukraine um, to for our members to address all the uh, concerns there and helping people that were needing to uh, leave the Ukraine and and um, help in Romania and other Poland and other areas, as well as 200,000 for uh, our members to respond to the floods in Pakistan. So tonight, we're really delighted that we're able to have um, one of our members showca showcase uh, projects that they're involved with, um, that MCIC has been able to provide just a little bit of money to assist them in the work that they're doing in Malawi. So I'm really, really excited to uh, have more people hear about the amazing work of um, Kuala Christian Girls School. So I'll turn it back to you, Kauser. Thank you very much, Janice. Uh, such an inspiring uh, start of our today's evening. Uh, the audience, uh, as we always do traditionally, 
Uh, on behalf of Conflict and Resilience Research Institute Canada, we would also like to acknowledge that we are located on original lands of Anishinaabe Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homelands of Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to moving forward in partnership with indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Dear audience, our session today is being live streamed on Creek's YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and cable TV channel, ATV Canada. Please send your questions via our social media feeds for the speaker and for the executive director of MCIC. Our plan today is to listen first and uh, subsequently ask our guest, Mr. Mark Kinzel, and I'll join in a conversation with him about his project, Koala Christian Girls School and its activities in Malawi. We'd like to wrap up by 6.45, we promise. So I suppose it's time to introduce our esteemed guest today and uh, he is patiently waiting in the wings. Mark Kinzel is the vice chair of uh, Investor Group Wealth Management and oversees a network of 64 regional offices over 2,100 consultants across Canada. Mark joined Investors Group in 1983. He was appointed Senior Vice President of Financial Services in 1999 and Executive Vice President of Financial Service in 2004. In 2020, Mark was appointed Vice Chair of Investor Group Wealth Management. Mr. Kinzel is a graduate of the University of Regina where he received his bachelor's degree in administration. Throughout his career, both in Winnipeg and Regina, he has been and continues to be involved in a number of volunteer positions. Mark, welcome to the show. How are you doing today, sir? Well, Hazar, thank you very much uh, for having me. Janice, thank you very much for organizing as well. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here and uh, to talk about something that uh, is very near and dear to me, and that's uh, our school that we have in Malawi. So thanks for having me. Thank you, Mark. The audience, uh, before we dive into our conversation, let me tell you what makes today's event a unique opportunity for our viewers to learn not only about the impressive project that Mark's team is running, but also a very about similar project that we have undertaken for over three years now. In both cases, the recipients are female adolescents who face monumental disadvantages in accessing education for a better life. Education in emergencies for marginalized people has evolved into its own discipline. The organization that curates ideas and innovates new methods for educating the marginalized is called Interagency Network for Education in Emergencies, in short, I-N-N-E. The Interagency Network for Education in Emergencies is an open, open global network for members working together within a humanitarian and development framework to ensure that all individuals have the right to a quality, safe, relevant, and equitable education. INEE's work is founded on the fundamental right to education. Education is a basic fundamental human rights. Creek follows its guidelines for delivering education for the Rohingya in Bangladesh, and Creek is also very gratefully acknowledged MCIC's contribution supporting two of its pilot projects. For those who do not know, the Rohingyas are one of the most persecuted ethnic and cultural group in the world, according to the UN's observation. And this is where Creek invests its energy and its ideas to support their education. So before we uh, get into conversation with Mark, uh, I think it is uh, paramount important to have a brief view about uh, the school itself, uh, the children, those who are studying there, and in general, the overall objective of the project. So in order to do so, I would uh, show and share a brief uh, clip of the activities of the school. Please bear with us.
From our first purchase of 12 hectares of barren land in one of Malawi's poorest areas in 2017, to our first high school graduating class in 2022, we have been on an educational journey of hope and opportunity. Working exclusively with high school age girls from some of the poorest communities in a country where poverty impacts 80% of the 20 million inhabitants, Koala Christian Girls School is succeeding in its mission to provide quality education to 120 students. Students are selected from exceptionally high numbers of applicants for a tuition-free four-year education in a safe, professional, and advanced technological and vocational environment. This life-changing opportunity equips the girls to become leaders in their families, communities, and countries. I'm really happy to be at this campus because in this campus we are taught different things. As this is a Christian school, they need us to live in harmony with others and to help others as you, our donors, have already helped us. And we are taught to work hard. We have that hard-working spirit. I'm very proud of my donors in Canada because they are helping me to be in this campus. Otherwise, I'd be there. Maybe now I have stopped the schooling because my parents wouldn't manage to finish paying for me the school fees. I say thank you to my donors in Canada. You are really doing a great job that you have made me to be here where I am. Although I have not yet finished my education, but I can see my great future, and my future is in your hands. As you are donating whatever you have to us, I, li I don't take this for granted. I take this as a precious thing. May God bless you. Because we appreciate to have uh, laptop computers at our school. Uh, this is helping the girls to improve in, in their studies. It's a new technology uh, given to the village students. They always get excited to touch a laptop in a day. Uh, a good number of them were able to work, learn books, access Alice's stuff from, from the computers. It's really improving our, our lesson. Today. Without the opportunity at Koala, our students, who have little to no family capacity for school tuition, would be faced with trying to succeed in an environment where there are few, if any, supports to study and learn. Girls in particular are negatively impacted with less than a third of high school aged girls gaining the equivalency of a high school education. Pressure to marry as a teenager adds to the difficulties girls face. In 2022, for the girls who did qualify to write the final Malawi School Certificate of Education exam, the national pass rate was 58%, while the pass rate for the first graduating class at Koala was 93%. I thank you the donors for helping us like in many things. I really thank you and may God bless you. I wouldn't go to school, I would stop schooling. And I even see that I would have married. So I thank you very much. May God bless you and continue praying for us so that we can make it. Over the past five years, we have aggressively developed our campus by planting trees and gardens, introducing greenhouses and a whole farming operation. At the same time, our core infrastructure has centered around our 200-person assembly hall and adjoining kitchen. Two 60-student dormitories align with our two classroom blocks with six classrooms. Our water tower, full property fencing, expanding number of staff houses and duplexes are all adding to our campus environment. A biogas program, a second water well, a new science lab, and a campus-wide solar power installation are underway. Equipping ourselves with reliable power in a country with regular blackouts is critical. Producing our cooking gas is both cost-effective and environmentally sensitive. A fully equipped science lab to complement our computer lab builds the quality of education we can deliver. Finally, we are completing our maize grinding building so we are equipped to support our school's requirements and offer a much needed service to the women of the surrounding communities. The meeting center where we're going to plant a maize milling and shelling machine. Um, this is a very big convenience for us because for us to prepare meals for the students, we have to carry the corn to some five, seven kilometers. Uh, so meeting right here will reduce the cost of transportation and move the time we needed to process. At the same time, we have neighbors like the neighboring community is going to also take advantage of this establishment. They've been meeting close by. Uh, 
we have women there who carry uh, probably a 30 kilogram bag of corn to some seven kilometers away to mill and that's a waste of time and that's a lot of labor, pen, painstaking labor. So we've brought this close to them and yeah, that creates good neighborliness with them. Thank you. Our success to date and our ambitious plans for the future are a result of our growing number of partners across North America. Your donations are driving change, a measurable and dramatic change, one student at a time. Core to the overall program is our focus on building an environment where climate resiliency and ongoing sustainability are core to all that we do. By incorporating a discipline of environmental respect, we are working to have a sustainable program and also provide a hands-on education to our students, equipping them to take what they learn back to their communities. I'm explaining the difference between the, this outer brick and the inner brick. Uh, the outer brick is uh, more cosmetic, uh, more beautiful, but it's expensive. So we have to build the inside using uh, cement blocks because we're going to plaster them anyway and they cover the ground very quickly. Um, the bigger picture though is our eco-friendly construction, this brick. There's no wood that is destroyed in trying to make this brick. And the same with that, it's cement and, and sand. While this is just soil pressed together with a slight mixture of uh, cement. Yeah. Uh, traditional Malawians used to build with uh, brick keyword using firewood. But we, 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 we don't want any of that on camp this campus. We don't want to, to have a deforestation footprint. Okay, so we, 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 that's the model. As we look into our future, our focus is on expanding our on-campus staff housing, continuing to build a fully sustainable farming operation, constructing and equipping our new workshop to support the school and teach additional skills to our students, purchasing a minibus to provide opportunities for field trips, building a central administration building for a dedicated library, clinic, and staff meeting area, and focusing on how we can use Starlink in the future to bring true distance education to Koala. Your continued support will make all of this possible and the life-changing experience continue to grow at Koala Christian Girls School. We just want to thank you so much for everything that you've done. You've made us smile in this year. We've seen our girls doing well. We've seen this institution glowing, and I know it's because of our partnership. Thank you very much. Uh, what an uplifting story and uh, especially it's very moving to hear the Canadian uh, national anthem uh, far across Malawi to the voices of children. Thank you so much Mark for your effort. Thank you MCIC for supporting such an effort. The audience, uh, it's time uh, for us to engage Mark and listen to him and uh, we have uh, kind of prepared some questions uh, just to go structurally and to be cautious about our time uh, but definitely uh, we are looking forward to have more discussions as we move forward so mark uh, our first question to you today is uh, uh, tell me how you first thought of running an education project uh, for the uh, female children in Malawi and uh, most importantly why Malawi 
We went, we went there, there in the with the idea, idea of exploring, exploring. Uh, how, how could we, we a group of folks who felt that we had you know tremendous opportunities here in Canada do something to work with individuals to to benefit them it uh, became uh, very very uh, in, apparent that uh, the path forward would be through education and specifically through girls' education. Uh, Malawi ended up being a great spot for us. I didn't realize at that time, but their official language is English. So from a communication perspective, it was certainly very beneficial to us. So that really is the path, how we got started. Uh, we came back, went through all the process of uh, setting up a charity and so on. But one other important part happened when we were there. Uh, we met an outstanding uh, couple who became our partners uh, on the ground in Malawi. And then from that path forward, we moved to where we are today and uh, are very excited about it. Thank you, Mark. Uh, uh, it's, it's a wonderful story, actually. And uh, so just building up uh, on this question. So what does koala mean? And uh, what is this culture about koala culture that we uh, we see in your website? Uh, uh, and it is written quite extensively. So, can you just uh, share a bit for our uh, for our uh, viewers today? Certainly. Certainly. Yeah. Koala Koala in, in the local language, uh, Chikewa means shining, and so we thought that was an appropriate term to use in terms of of what we're doing with students um, in Malawi. Uh, girls have a, a very big challenge with regards to gaining additional education. Uh, there is a significant. Uh, child marriage issue that still takes place uh, in Malawi. A lot of pressure on young women uh, to get married very young, to stay at home. And therefore, in terms of their ability to get an education, we felt that they could be shining lights going forward. And in fact, that's the path that we've taken is working with young women, uh, girls from deeply impoverished backgrounds who don't have another opportunity, equipping them with the skill set to get an education so that they can go back and then be leaders within their villages. And that's the path that we've been taking. Uh, absolutely uh, brilliant. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, Mark, I'm going uh, ahead with the uh, project itself and uh, how long this project uh, has been running. And if you give us a brief overview of the first day you uh, landed in, uh, in Malawi and specifically in the area that we have seen in the video, uh, it's, it's structures coming up so well. So tell us more about the story itself. Certainly. certainly. So, uh, in 2020, 2020 uh, a small group of us, we were all together. And, and this certainly is not just me. It is a, a team of individuals that started from day one together. Um, and through that discovery process came to the conclusion that, you know, education was the path to go. And clearly that uh, these partners that we met on the ground were the right folks to work with. We returned back with them. Uh, we came to sort of some agreements and understanding and made a determination that we would be focused on really underserved communities. So we would be working with families who were from very impoverished backgrounds. And therefore, we uh, the first step was to determine where we could purchase some land. So in 2017, uh, we purchased 12 and a half hectares of land. It's about 40 minutes outside of the capital city of the long way, the long way in, in Malawi. Malawi is about one fifth uh, the size of Manitoba. It has a population of just under 20 million people. The capital city of the long way is about the same size of, of Winnipeg approximately. So we're uh, again about 40 minutes outside in a, a, a rural area, a very poor area. And that's where we purchased our first property intentionally in that area, because we knew that was really as a starting place where we want to draw our students from. So from that point in 2017, uh, we then uh, the first thing we did was uh, drill for water. And we were fortunate. We uh, got it an outstanding well, uh, built our water tower. Uh, we started to go from that point on building our first classroom block. 
of three classrooms and also our first dormitory. Uh, in Malawi, uh, because there is no real structure for uh, public transportation, uh, there no real great communication program, it was important that we could create a very safe environment so that the girls could come to a location where they could uh, really focus on education. And that was why we became a, a boarding school. That is a, a, certainly the path to go in Malawi. And then from that point on, we just started to move forward in terms of both our program. We started with 60 students. We now have 120. Um, the campus has developed. It's now added on a full farming operation. We'll be up to 50 acres of farming going with the program. It's all fenced. Uh, we have 24 hour security as well. And we really started to create an environment where not only are we a safe environment for girls to come and receive an education, but we're also now an environment that's benefiting the community surrounding us. We're in an area that is filled with small villages. Uh, and we now have become obviously an employer in the area. We become an educator in the area as well. And we're now in a position where a lot of the additional work we do is outreach into those communities. Uh, we have students going out into the communities, working with the youth, uh, meeting with the elders. And really that's part of us going back and actually educating by doing as well. So that's a bit of the, of the path that we've followed over the last few years. Thank you so much. We have, uh, I think, uh, uh, quite a uh, idea about the project itself and how it uh, started. Mark, uh, moving on to the next question, uh, we are curious to know, uh, how did you choose uh, the beneficiaries, uh, i.e. the uh, female students? Uh, have you followed some criteria? And I'm sure uh, there is much need of education uh, the way we see Rohingyas in Bangladesh. Uh, I mean, the resources are so uh, scanty, but uh, what are the criteria that uh, you might have thought uh, to select students? And in your website, I, I do see an interesting quote. It says uh, it is based on a proven model and uh, you would provide tuition free education. So what kind of model you are referring to? And how did you uh, see that model is working with the children? Uh, can you share uh, with our audience now? Certainly, so when we were in the recovery phase, uh, we, uh, what, what we saw was there were uh, some schools, and, and one example we saw in particular, where uh, a number of the students were paying students, but out of that, they did have some scholarship opportunities. And that really seemed to be effective in terms of actually taking individuals and young women uh, from uh, backgrounds where they could not afford tuition and getting them into a situation where they could then uh, come in. They were very hard workers and achieve an education. From that, we thought, well, what if we could put a school that was exclusively, exclusively focused on women and exclusively focused on scholarships? In other words, a totally tuition free school that catered directly to young women who came from backgrounds where they had no other choice without us. Uh, they would not be able to go on and get an education. They would probably stay uh, at home and they would not be able to further and advance themselves. So to do that, uh, we then started to put in a process where when we have applicants coming in, we go through a very thorough interview process to identify those individuals who are appropriate for what we're trying to achieve. We also adopted a policy where we only take one student from every village. And the rationale for that is, we want to help young women to become leaders so they can go back into their villages and influence other people. I can tell you right now, the demand, is, as you point out, is in, in so many areas and certainly in Malawi is overwhelming. Uh, we have a, a, a high school, so it's called Forms 1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, here in Canada, it would be grades 9, 10, 11 and 12. We have 120 students. Uh, we had 20 openings uh, come up and we had uh, almost 600 students prospective students line up at our gate at six o'clock in the morning to try and get into our school. So the demand is significant, but the process is in place to say, we want to have those students come where this is really a life-changing operation or opportunity for them. Uh, what we've also discovered is the work ethic of our students is outstanding and the work ethic of our staff and our teachers as well. They are totally committed. They realize this opportunity and they realize that they really have 
uh, almost a duty they feel to themselves to take advantage of it, to work hard and to make the most of it. So we have a very significant process in place. Uh, the volume and the demand uh, can be daunting at times, uh, but we're doing our best to be able to keep up with that in terms of our way and really ultimately to graduate leaders. Wow, such a wonderful plan. And actually, this is what is important, uh, the plan itself, because as I mentioned and Mark agrees today, the audience, the uh, supply and demand equation of education, there's a huge demand and uh, from the supply side, NGOs and UNICEF and other organizations, they can only, uh, you know, uh, submit and provide a few. Uh, moving on to... Uh, your uh, newsletters and I, these are incredibly beautiful and full of information mark i congratulate your team to put up putting up in, in uh, you know in such a way that uh, you have uh, uh, all the information there so in one of the uh, newsletters i see a quote and i quote from there we do not inherit the art from our ancestors we borrow it from our children unquote what does this uh, philosophy signifies uh, and uh, do you see uh, young girls there taking education are inspired uh, from this quote? Uh, yes, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Let me are something very important. Uh, anyone who goes to our website, we have all of them there and we faithfully produce them every month. Uh, from the very start, uh, we felt that the only way this would thrive if we could create partnerships with Canadians to support this and then obviously partnerships with Malawians. And we thought one of the core items was to make sure that we kept people very informed, that we were transparent, that we kept people tuned as to what was taking place. And, and that's the rationale behind the newsletters. And now that we're starting to do videos as well, they're all produced by us. We have no paid staff, even on the ground in Malawi. We have volunteers who take all our photos and provide all the information to us. The quote you reference is, is really talking about a, a bit of an evolution that's taken place in the school. We become very sensitive to our environment. And in Malawi, as in much of Africa, uh, they are really bearing a, a large brunt of, of climate change. Uh, there are, uh, it, because of the, the poverty, uh, much of the cooking is done under open fires. Therefore, you have deforestation taking place extensive use of fertilizer because you use small plots of land and dramatic swings in terms of the uh, the weather that's taking place. A cyclone uh, a year ago wiped out uh, over a quarter of the power generation in the country, causing massive blackouts. So we've really taken on the path saying we have to not only educate, we're a, a registered school, we follow the national curriculum, but also that we can actually educate on respect for the environment and how to to our best ability become climate resilient. So we partnered those pieces together with the idea being that, you know, the land we live in is very important. Uh, we're here, uh, we're utilizing it, but we also have a duty to make sure that we work in harmony with it. And so all that we do is really becomes a teaching element. Uh, thus, we are expanding our farming operation. And why doing that at a school, not only can we produce for ourselves, but now it's an education opportunity. We are introducing solar power because we want to create our own power generation. We are introducing a biogas program so we can produce our own gas for cooking. And then the output from that is, is a slurry that will be used in fertilizer. So all of these things we're doing so that we can certainly walk sort of the talk in terms of being respectful of the environment, teach the, the students because they see it every day, they're involved with it. And then our goal is, when they graduate, not only with a high school graduation, but with this understanding that they can go back and can take those ideas and those concepts back into their community. So that really is the program is to be respectful. We're here, uh, we're utilizing uh, this great world that we live in, but we have a duty to treat it with respect because there'll be another generation coming along as well. And that's really what's behind that. I think it's, it's another comprehensive uh, scheme of educating uh, children uh, with all the resources available and I think uh, the audience if you have marked uh, uh, Mark's uh, comments that uh, being respectful and in the field of uh, not-for-profit organizations uh, in the world uh, delivering much needed aid uh, in terms of education or 
basic wash facilities we always hear this uh, word do no harm so this policy is is very very important and you have just heard from uh, mark's experience that uh, in this project they are really very mindful about it and another thing mark mentioned which really uh, drew my attention here is that uh, in in their project uh, they are building children as leaders so that they go back to their communities and take on these leadership roles and emulate what they have learned in this school mark that is really really wonderful uh, moving on to the next uh, uh, question that i have in mind mark uh, what are the challenges you face so far and for our audience can you mention uh, two to three challenges and the way you overcome it uh, certainly, certainly. Uh, there have been a few challenges along the way and uh, number one when we started out um, I do not have an education background uh, I was very fortunate that the uh, the other individuals who were in the founding parts of this whole program with me had really balanced approaches to what they the expertise and skills they brought so as a team we were able to move forward with the school um, Poverty, the extreme level of poverty has really been a, a significant challenge. And it's a challenge because just infrastructure issues um, are, are very difficult. And, you know, being able to progress, uh, you know, in Canada, I, I, we certainly become impatient. We want things done right now. Uh, you have to be patient. You have to take your time with it. So I would say the overall issue of, of poverty, um, but it's also presented opportunities, uh, for creative ways that we can do things. So that has been a challenge. Um, access to power. It's something we take for granted. But in Malawi, where you have uh, very regular blackouts, just the ability to communicate uh, and the ability to set up a program where you can talk back and forth. Uh, there's an eight hour time difference, obviously a, a lot of mileage between where we are and where Malawi is. So that was something that we had to overcome as well. And, and we did uh, with, uh, you know, with creativity in terms of, of uh, how we might do that as well. So, you know, that that part of, of poverty and accessibility and predictability in terms of power, uh, those were items that uh, really created challenges for us. But having said that, it also caused us to be creative. Um, Malawi is called the, uh, the warm heart of Africa. It's uh, the, the people are wonderful. They're great. They're uh, excellent to work with and to partner with. And so therefore, while those were challenges, we had to be creative and we had to come with solutions. And I think because we had to work hard on those solutions, it made us stronger. And we came up with solutions that were longstanding as well. So, you know, the distance is one thing. I think one of the benefits uh, has been the rapid development, uh, you know, the way that we're communicating now using things like Zoom, uh, using WhatsApp. Uh, it's all been benefiting to us so that we can have a strong, strong linkage with them. And so we've learned through those challenges. And I'd say now we have a really disciplined process in place in terms of how we stay in touch. That is excellent. Actually, uh, I was trying to remember uh, our projects and the challenges. I think these are pretty much common challenges we all face in delivering uh, education in for the marginalized. Uh, the audience, uh, I am going to ask a very important question to Mark now with regards to the future of the children. So in August 2022, uh, your first, uh, 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 sorry, uh, this year, your first cohort of the students uh, would have graduated. So what are their thoughts for the future and would they end up in higher studies or employment? So give our audience a, a, a picture of Malawi's economic system and within this overall system, how your graduates are going to uh, get their spaces uh, in terms of employment or uh, in terms of you know, social participation of activities. Uh, certainly, certainly. You know, you know, Malawi's, Malawi's economy, economy is, 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 is very, very, very challenging, and uh, that certainly goes without saying. Uh, but within it, uh, our, our, our views are this. Uh, first of all, we did have our first graduation class of our first 60 students, and quite frankly, we were thrilled with the results. If you look at the number of women who actually, uh, young girls who graduate and go through high school in Malawi, uh, it's probably less than 20% of the eligible individuals. Of all the girls in school who wrote their final national exam, there was a pass rate of 58%. Our pass rate at our school, we had 56 out of 60 pass, uh, well over 90%. So first of all, we were thrilled with the results. What happens next is, 
Number one, uh, a number of the girls will go back into their local communities. Um, 80% of Malawi is based on agriculture. Uh, women are the predominant leaders in agriculture, but they'll go back to their villages with confidence. They'll go back with more knowledge. And I believe that they will help to develop things within their villages as well. Secondly, uh, we have a fully computerized school. We have a one-to-one -one basis of computers to our students. Uh, we have a, a real learning program through computers. And this is a very big deal because the first time our students have ever seen a computer is they come to the school. That equips them for additional opportunities to go into the city uh, to get work where you have to have a technology background. We take that for granted here. Uh, our, our youngest uh, folks in our country are working on a tablet, uh, but this is a real win for our students. So we've equipped them to go back to their homes uh, confident, uh, certainly with a, with a high school education and with ideas uh, that they can go and they can help their communities. We give them the ability to understand technology, so we've opened doors for them within the workplace. And then we'll have a number of our students who will qualify for additional education. One of the projects we're working on is how can we put a scholarship program in place so that when they graduate, we can assist them to go on to a, a college degree or a university degree, because there are colleges and universities in, in Malawi. So pretty early days for us still on this. Um, but we are really looking at how we can follow through with the girls and give them more opportunities uh, as well as we go forward. So that's one of our, our projects that we're working on. The other one is putting in place a follow program, our follow-up program. We uh, have uh, four uh, students uh, that we are keeping at the school. We've offered them employment after their, their graduation. And one of the goals is working with them on how we can track our students, stay in touch. I guess you might call it a bit of an alumni program. And we're going to learn, uh, quite frankly, we're going to learn as we go. We're going to learn what we can do to assist them going forward. And we also have a view, is there a way we could put a microfinance program in place? Because we do so much almost vocational training, uh, could we set up a microfinance program so when they go back to their homes and villages, we could help them to start small businesses? Uh, one of the projects that MCIC helped us with early on was a greenhouse. And the girls are learning how to utilize that. Could they go back and start small greenhouse programs where they are? Uh, we now are building a workshop, again, with, with more support from MCIC on this, and where we're going to be teaching them basic trade skills. Could we go back and help them develop uh, trades uh, and utilizing those skills? So we're really trying to figure out how can we go beyond the school to assist them once they graduate and they go back to their communities. Such a inspiring stories and uh, the plan itself. And uh, this is so important to understand that there should be a follow up because education is not the end product uh, of after you know grade three or five or seven. It must be followed up so that the retention of knowledge and skill remains uh, within the uh, children it's, uh, themselves. So uh, my uh, last question to you, just to be conscious about time to, tonight. Um, so what are your hopes and fears for the future of the school, future of the students as they graduate and as they enter in their lives? Um, um, you know, you know I, I'm not so sure that I have fears. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic and pretty positive. Um, I think one of my concerns is that we don't get done as much as we need to get done. There is such an incredible demand for, for what we're doing. And I think that's the one thing I focus on is how can we make sure that we do everything possible to assist as many people as we can in Malawi, that we are great partners with our Malawian colleagues and that we really are bringing forward everything that is possible on our part. I, I don't want to miss the opportunity because that video that you watched, um, that was from a visit that just took place when we were there in December. And to see the change in these young women when they come forward and have been at our school for a period of time, to hear from their parents, we have a parent teacher association, it's just remarkable. So my concern is to make sure that we do everything we can that we have uh, don't have any misses and that we really go for it and provide as much of opportunity as we possibly can. Absolutely wonderful. And we have received some questions already from the audience and I flashed just one. Uh, but uh, before we request Mark to uh, respond to this question, uh, uh, as you can see here on the screen, 
uh, and we are just uh, very close to the end of the session today as per our previous plan but uh, I will just take two questions I think uh, we can manage time within that uh, framework so Mark uh, feel free to uh, respond to the question as you see on the screen Certainly, Certainly. Uh, and, and I think I think that's one part, part of it. One piece, piece in the job, job it is a very very significant indicator there. there. The government, the government is very actively, actively working to you know, to educate uh, on on why this is is something they want to move away from. Um, well, we don't have a specific campaign. Uh, our students come to our school, and one of the first things we do is work to teach the the girls about their rights about what they should do in terms of the respect they, they should have. And I think by doing that, what we're doing is we're educating them and they, they in turn are educating their siblings. And when they go back on their breaks and whatnot to the villages, they're more confident. And that's sending a message, I believe, to others in their community that you don't need to get married. You can avoid, you know, you know fight against that pressure because there are other opportunities. So I think really, the best thing we're doing is creating strong, and this goes back to my, com my, my comments about leaders, strong leaders. So when they go back, other girls see what they're doing and they take belief from them that there's more of an opportunity for us. And I believe that's really helping and, and starting to work very well. And I can tell you, just for just being in member, um, um, this, this is something, something that yeah. everyone, all the parents, they're, they're very pro on this and that getting girls in education is probably the best way to sort of uh, push against the pressure for child marriage. Thank you. Uh, so uh, the next question is up and we, we don't have much time left actually, but uh, let's hear from you uh, because uh, I think uh, the question is worth pondering upon how this education model can reduce vulnerability uh, of the community. Um, so Mark, your comments, please. Um, now, um, just uh, that question. Can you just repeat it for me? Because I'm, I'm probably missing some subjects. Oh, uh, the uh, the question is: uh, there are various types of vulnerabilities, uh, like social, economic, physical, etc., uh, prevailing in the society of Malawi. So, how this education model that you described for our audience today reduce vulnerabilities of the uh, in the community? Um, I'll try and answer that. Uh, because we are going out and, and first of all, we are, are, are serving um, specifically, um, almost I'll, I'll call it a, a clientele, our, our students who are the most vulnerable. Uh, they come from deeply impoverished backgrounds. They're girls who are often treated uh, as second class. Um, if the family has any funds at all, it will go to the boys. So we are specifically working to address the most vulnerable. And they were bringing them into an environment where they are treated with respect, with safety. They are given the, the, the best education possible and equipping them to go back and be influencers. So I think that's probably what we're doing in terms of our, our small way, but important way of helping the country move forward because we're taking girls from, again, who are the most vulnerable and equipping them to actually come you know, full circle and be strong and brave and confident and then they go back and they start to spread that message. And I think yeah, that's really 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 how we can really, really start to get ahead of it. Thank you so much, uh, Mark. Uh, I think uh, th th these are fantastic response to the questions. So just for the uh, paucity of time, we have taken only two questions from the audience. Uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, Mark has uh, tried his best to respond. And uh, most importantly, uh, please uh, listen to the last part where Mark emphasized that vulnerability will remain, but we have to find innovative ways to deal with it. And uh, if we train and teach children uh, to be resilient, uh, this is the only way they can face challenges in their practical lives. The audience, we are absolutely at the end of the session, but uh, before we go, uh, I would like to invite Executive Director of MCIC, Janice Hamilton, to say uh, a couple of last words, and then I shall summarize and conclude the session today. Janice, floor is yours, ma'am. Thank you so much. It's I'm always impressed when I hear about the work that Koala um, Christian Girls School has done. And I, I, I just think that there's going to be one of those girls that have graduated from that school that are in a few years are going to be running the country of Malawi and the economy of Malawi. And they're going to be really strong 
um, leaders. And so it starts small and it is very small, but the, what they have, what this organization has been able to accomplish in what, six or seven years, is it, Mark, um, is is really impressive. And uh, yeah, and thank you very much, Kauser, for your insightful questions and, and, uh, and, uh, and bringing, and this, bringing this to another audience. audience. Thank you, Janice, uh, for your wonderful remarks. The audience uh, for the past 48 minutes uh, we have uh, uh, with uh, we were we were with Mr. Mark Kinzel, and he uh, explained he shared his experiences about a wonderful school, a model, and inspiring stories of children in Malawi, those who are being trained and educated from the platform. The audience uh, education is fundamental human rights. There is no doubt through education we can address global poverty. We can address all the vices of the society. And there are tons of children, those who are marginalized and those who cannot access proper education in the world. And let's make a promise today in this International Development Week and organizations like MCIC and uh, its leadership that we provide and we focus our energy and our resources to do our best to provide whatever we can because they are our hope for the future. As Executive Director Janice Hamilton rightly mentioned, we would like to see some of the children become the Prime Minister of Malawi and proudly presents the contribution of Kuala Christian Girls High School. With these thoughts, I would leave uh, all of you today and uh, stay well, stay safe and stay warm from Winnipeg, Canada. Thank you very much for being with us and listen to the wonderful journey of uh, Mark Kinzel's team and his project in Malawi. Good night. Bye-bye.